Folks, we're about to start this next panel. Uh, you can see the title, Conflicting Security Reports from the, uh, the Halderman Springall Report and from MITRE, uh, which is right and why does it matter? Okay, I'm the moderator, I'm David Jefferson. I'm uh, on the board of directors of the Election Integrity Foundation and I've been doing uh, election integrity research for 25 years, but I'm just the moderator today. I want to introduce the real panelists. Uh, on, on my far left is Professor Rich DeMillo. He holds the Warren Chair of Computing at Georgia Tech. He founded the School of Cybersecurity at Georgia Tech and was its uh, first dean. He's the former uh, Chief Technology Officer of Hewlett Packard and was a division director at the National Science Foundation. Uh, he's been an observer of elections for the Carter Center and he served on the Michigan Election Security Co uh, Commission. Uh, and then the other panelist is uh, Professor Drew Springall. He, uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at Auburn University. And most uh, important is that he is the co-author of the Halderman Springall Report, which is at the, the central uh, issue in this uh, panel today. Um, uh, reporting on vulnerabilities in the ImageCast X uh, voting machine, uh, ballot marking device that would uh, that report was submitted to the court in the Curling versus Raffensperger uh, 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 federal lawsuit that's still ongoing. I'll say a little more about that in a minute. So now I'm going to give a little background for the rest of the panel. Uh, the state of Georgia, oh, let's see, let me switch this. Um, the state of Georgia is unusual among states in that all voters in the entire state that don't use mail-in ballots use the exact same uh, BMD voting system. From 2000 and, uh, now, from 2002 to 2019, they used the Debolt TS DRE system, um, but in 2017, a group of plaintiffs, um, including the Coalition for Good Governance, uh, filed a federal lawsuit, Curling versus Kemp, now called Curling versus Raffensperger, arguing that DREs used then are actually unconstitutional. A lead plaintiff in that case is in our audience here, Marilyn Marks, right there. Raise your hand. And several of the, several of the, yes, applaud. <laughs> and several of the expert witnesses are also in this room. So uh, there are a lot of people you can talk to about it. In 2019, the court, the federal court, agreed that the DREs in use in Georgia are unconstitutional and Georgia was required to scrap them and procure a new voting system. They did, and they chose the Dominion ImageCast X ballot marking device. Um, the curling lawsuit was then amended uh, and, uh, to ask the court to rule those machines as unconstitutional as well. And that lawsuit is still ongoing. So, uh, as part of the curling lawsuit, the court asked the University of Michigan professor Alex Halderman uh, and um, Drew Springall to study the ImageCast X machine and, uh, and examine it for vulnerabilities and, and that were real and that were exploitable. And they wrote such a report and, uh, and submitted it to the court, um, delineating a lot of such vulnerabilities. Um, Unfortunately, the court sealed the full report for almost three years before unsealing it. So it was a long time before anybody knew much about what was, what was in that report. While the report was sealed, somehow Dominion, the manufacturer of the machine, who is not a party to the lawsuit, managed to procure a copy of the sealed report and enlisted MITRE Corporation to do what they called an independent review of the Halderman Springall report in reply to it. Uh, in MITRE's report, they claimed essentially that while the Halderman Springall vulnerabilities described in that report were real, uh, MITRE tried to claim that they are not operationally feasible given Georgia's operational procedures to, uh, to exploit them. Let me see it. Uh, and uh, MITRE's conclusions were based on the questionable assumption that all of the laws and regulations for administering elections in Georgia were faithfully adhered to by all relevant parties, which of course is not exactly true. 
A couple of months ago, in response to the MITRE report, uh, 30 uh, technology experts, voting technology experts, including me, for example, wrote a letter to uh, MITRE asking that they withdraw that report um, because of quality problems and actual errors in the court in the in the report. Uh, MITRE didn't immediately respond to that, but at MITRE's request, they met with some of those experts, including Professor DeMillo here at Georgia Tech, uh, to try to have a meeting of minds uh, about the MITRE report. In the course of that meeting, face-to-face -face meeting, MITRE agreed in, uh, to, that the errors were real, but refused to reconsider their conclusions in the light of those errors, refused a more formal peer review, told the press that they continue to stand by their conclusions despite those errors, and incidentally did not respond to a, an invitation from us to appear on this panel. Now, in fairness, I have to say we only invited them last weekend, so I don't actually, uh, I'm not terribly critical of that because it's short notice, but still, we did invite them. We also invited Dominion, uh, who also did not respond. So at this point, with that background, I'm going to turn this over to Professor Rich DeMillo. Great, thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, good, thank you. Um, so, um, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of the, um, of the controversy between um, the Haldeman Springall report and what's in the, what's in the MITRE um, what's in the MITRE report. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to boil it down to the essentials. There's a lot of, yes, speak up. You turn the volume up, turn the gain up. How, How about this? Um, so what I'd like to do is to give. How's that? Yes? Are we good? Good? I'm, I'm, I'm nodding to... Okay, great. Um, so the MITRE, the, the, the MITRE report, I think, has, has some problems that we have to, we have to acknowledge uh, up front. Um, you can see on the screen the conclusion of the report. Page 39 of the report is absolutely crystal clear what MITRE uh, intended to do. They intended to go through each of the proposed vulnerabilities uh, in, uh, in the Halderman Springall report uh, and argue that, that those vulnerabilities uh, were infeasible to exploit because of the way that Georgia manages its election, um, election infrastructure. Um, I have to say that that um, MITRE did not put their hands on a Dominion voting machine during this entire analysis. Uh, and, and as you will see, um, they didn't spend a great deal of time and effort to figure out whether or not what they were saying about how Georgia manages its elections was actually true. Um, so, so I will start out um, by complaining uh, about the title that MITRE chose for the report. Um, this is a report that is neither independent, it relies only on the Springall Halderman report for the existence of the vulnerabilities, it relies only on the representations of the Georgia Secretary of State for how elections are managed. Um, there is no independent work that took place uh, in, producing, uh, in producing this report. And you could argue, I will argue, um, that the second part of the title, that this is a technical review, uh, uh, is also a bit of a bait and switch. There's no evidence in this report that any technical review took, took place. If this had been a term assignment uh, for, for a senior at Georgia Tech, I would have asked to see, see his work, her work. Um, we asked that of the MITRE, of the MITRE people, uh, and they said, well, we don't have it. 
we don't have any background work that, that supports the, uh, the assertions that we're making. You'll see why that's important uh, in just a few seconds. But, but I'll give you just, just a second to observe what this conclusion says. It says, we might have gone through every one of these vulnerabilities and we have found that they are infeasible to mount given the way Georgia manages its elections. It's a pretty simple, it's a pretty simple syllogism that they've asked us to, um, uh, to, to take a look at. Well, first of all, the Georgia Secretary of State was just thrilled with this idea um, because um, uh, if he had read the CISA advisory, he would have been compelled to patch the software that was running in Georgia to mitigate the vulnerabilities. Um, but now he has a report from, from a respected FFRDC that says, don't worry about it, it's infeasible to mount these attacks anyway. So we are going into the 2024 presidential election running software that has the known vulnerabilities that we will talk about uh, in a few minutes and virtually no way to mitigate those vulnerabilities. So what's the problem with this? Aside from the, aside from the, the obvious things that I've mentioned, um, mentioned already. Um, so there's obviously the problem that MITRE did no independent work. Um, okay, so they've misrepresented uh, what, they, what they did do um, for, um, uh, for Dominion. They, they accepted the vulnerability uh, analysis that's in the Haldeman Springall report. Um, they accepted Georgia Secretary of State standards, uh, representations. Um, they were unable to provide any evidence for what they were saying, that what they were saying was, uh, was true. But, but there's, an underlying, there's an underlying scientific problem. The underlying scientific problem is that, is that their assumptions were not, their assumptions were not hypotheses made about the way Georgia runs its elections. They are artificial constructs that are used to contradict the feasibility of the vulnerabilities. So, so they sat back and said, so what does it take in order to, 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 to defeat this, this kind of vulnerability? Well, if we do this, then you won't be able to mount that kind of attack. Said, well, that's good, let's do that, let's say that. Let's say that, that's how Georgia runs its, uh, its elections. Because if we do that for all the vulnerabilities, then the vulnerabilities are not um, are not feasible. The MITRE conclusions depend exclusively on the truth of these assumptions. You can read the report. The report is, 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 is online. There is not a single sentence in the report that goes outside the assumptions that we're about to talk about. Not a single word. And finally, every single one of those damn assumptions is false. How do we know it's false? Because we did what MITRE didn't do. We asked, we looked at press releases, we looked at, at FOIA, uh, uh, FOIA, uh, FOIA documents. Every single assumption that MITRE made in its report is either an outright falsehood, it's false and they know it's false, it's misleading in that they misrepresented what the, what the assumption actually said, um, or it's technically meaningless, using words like statistically significant that are inappropriate for the, for the, the context. Um, and if that's the case, if that's the case, then you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of this report? The purpose of this report is to provide the Secretary of State a mechanism whereby he does not have to update the Dominion software for the 2024 presidential election. So what are some of these problems? I'm gonna turn things over to, to Drew in a few minutes and he will take you through, through some more detail. But let's, at the 30,000 foot level, what are some of the problems with the MITRE um, assumptions? So the MITRE assumptions are these kinds of statements. Standard practice in Georgia prevents unfettered access to voting machines of the kind that Halderman and Springall had when they discovered the vulnerabilities. Well, that's not true. 
There is a violation on videotape that you can see on the screen here in Coffee County, Georgia, of random people who work for the Stop the Steal campaign, kind of wandering around the election center in Coffee County, downloading executable images of the election management system that's used across the entire state of, of Georgia. Um, Haldeman and Springall had access to Dominion software for 12 weeks, something like that? 12 weeks. These folks had, had access to the software for years. Standard practice in Georgia is, is to let whoever can manage to get in the door at an election center wander around the technology and do whatever the hell they want with it. What else does the MITRE report say? The MITRE report says, well, the, these attacks that, that, that Halderman and Springall describe that are really QR code manipulations aren't feasible attacks because, you know, no rational person would count the QR codes when you have the text of the ballot sitting in front of you, right? That sounds like a perfectly rational thing to do, except that in Georgia it's not. What counts in Georgia is the QR code, not the printed text of the, of the, of the ballot. So all their objections related to the fact that, that you can detect QR code manipulation by simply comparing text to QR code doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all. And there are a bunch of, there are a bunch of uh, assumptions that have to do with the way that an RLA, risk limited audit, is run on the basis of this information, equally false. In, um, in summary, there are, there are page after page of, of assertions in the MITRE report that say essentially this. It is standard practice in Georgia to provide layers of protection for our physical infrastructure that prevent the kinds of attacks that are described by Halderman and Springall. This is a letter written by the incoming director of elections for Coffee County in Georgia. Um, and what it says is that when he walked into the election center in Coffee County, he found a complete state of disrepair. The warehouse was leaking, there were holes in the wall, sunlight was filtering, filtering through. There were magnetic media kind of strewn around, um, uh, around the center. There were driver's licenses that were, that were sitting on a table um, someplace. He described a scene of terrifying chaos for, for an election center. Um, this is not the only election center in, um, in Georgia that has this problem. You can argue that, that, that every election center that you walk into is going to have <clears throat> these kinds of lack of management capabilities that are, that are applied to the, the, the equipment. And we, and we talk in detail about each of, those, uh, each of those assumptions. So the assumption that standard practice in the state of Georgia is to lock down everything and keep tight controls over the, the equipment is simply not true. We invited MITRE leadership to a meeting at Georgia Tech to discuss these kinds of, these kinds of statements and many, many more. Um, I just thought you'd be interested in seeing, in the executive summary alone, what their assertions said versus what reality, reality is. Um, beginning with the top one. Each of the attacks requires access and opportunity that remains unavailable in the operational environment. Except that we know from Coffee County, we know from Jim Bridges, Report. We know from observation of what goes on in, um, uh, in the counties in Georgia that it's not true. And each one of those has a direct contradiction to ground truth that if you were serious about judging the truth or, or falsity of the assertion would make you step back and say, well, maybe we have to go back and look at these assertions again. 
In the course of a day, meeting with the MITRE people, we presented them with over 50 instances like that. And in each case, in each case, the MITRE representatives said, yeah, we see that. We believe the evidence. We think that what we said in the report was wrong. But we don't intend on changing the conclusions of the report. I'm going to turn things over to Drew. He can walk you through. <coughs> he can walk you through um, uh, some of the some of the details. Let me let me say while well, Drew is is coming up here, we did invite MITRE representatives to be at this meeting. Um, the invitation has been out to them for weeks. We made it again in the middle of July when they were visiting um, Georgia Tech, and I don't think there are MITRE representatives in the audience. If I missed anyone. Um, uh, but we do have a MITRE representative, we do have a Dominion representative um, with us today on the panel. <laughs> a Dominion ballot marking device. So these are the machines that are supposed to be unavailable for, for analysis. Uh, and as you can see, we just grabbed this one from the table over, over there where we're busy doing what? Working on understanding and recovery. Working on understanding and, 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 and recovery. So we have a collaborator from, Domi from Dominion. I'm going to turn things over to Drew, and then we'll come back and, and kind of summarize where this, where this leaves us. Good. So Rich talked a lot about this idea of you know, these procedural protection issues, these high-level issues with miners' approach to everything. But we can, you know, to make it more concrete, we can actually look at specific issues, specific problems, specific misunderstandings and, and misassumptions that, that exist in, in the, that exist in the MITRE report. You know, obviously, like Rich said, you know, these, these high difficulty assumptions about access to obtain the ICX software, access to obtaining ICX uh, hardware, using it for testing, things like that. When we have a BMD sitting right in front of us, you know, that, that kind of is not as high difficulty as it sounds because the actual analysis that MITRE uses relies on a very particular definition of high difficulty, which is achieving the intended purpose of the attack attack component requires a highly coordinated team of exceptionally skilled and experienced people. Now, you know, I personally think that's a little bit of a compliment, but I'll take it. But this high, very, very high bar creates the perception that it's almost impossible to do these things. So when it comes to our, you know, high difficulty assumption about inserting functionality into the actual application itself, yes, that's a non-trivial, that's a, a non-zero effort work. But when you start looking into the actual details, you find a footnote in MITRE's report itself linking to a 2015, yeah, 2015 Black Hat talk that talks, that walks you through the process of doing this, how to build additional functionality into a pre-built APK, into a pre-built application. It walks you through all of the exact steps to do this. And, you know, this is the way that we did it when we were building the proof of concept attacks. We went step one, go do step one. Step two, go do step two. And there's you know, nothing special about that public, publicly available information linked to by the report that prevents other people from being able to replicate that. You've also got this, you know, the, these assumptions all over the place about you know, detectability. This, you know, you know the high difficulty, this ex exceptionally talented and skilled team of coordinated individuals would be required to avoid detection from poll workers. Now, we've got our, our wonderful panel participant up here, which, yeah, if 
we're looking at this specific machine, trying to make sure that nobody's interfering with it, nobody's uh, modifying it, anything like that. Does anyone, does anyone have a, you know, as it sits right here, it's a pretty straightforward, yep, we could probably understand that. And that's the way that MITRE approached it. That's the assumptions that they made was based on, you know, something's kind of like this. Now, what happens if we, you know, get a little bit more real world and start, you know, actually voting on it? Does it become harder, easier, harder, more difficult to actually detect malicious behavior, malicious actions? You know, even, even if we kind of give it the, the best available, with the ports and everything, this is obviously a different device than Georgia, but with the ports being on the back, it gives you kind of a uh, better chance at detecting maliciousness, people trying to interfere, right? Except for the little parts that we can connect to. The parts in our report that aren't sealed, that aren't, aren't protected. That you know, the, anyone using these machines has access to. But even this doesn't really reflect the real world. Because if you've voted in you know, a recent election, now how does that assumption about detectability behave. That assumption about a poll worker noticing someone interfering with the machine, whether it's, you know, the bash bunny attacks, a piece of hardware you can walk down, I think it's that way, and for I think about $50, pick up and purchase and walk off with. So, you know, a lot of these assumptions start really impacting the feasibility and the analysis of it. Because whether it's facing facing you, facing away, with the screen, without the screen. This is still just one machine. You know, some places like State Farm Arena, we're talking about, you know, a handful of poll workers monitoring lots and lots and lots of machines with lots and lots of locations that can be reached into, the locations and ways to interact with them. So, you know, obviously, or this detectability assumption doesn't really hold up at all. You know, there's also this idea of, in order to obtain and, and perform the, or excuse me, prepare and build the attack, you have to you know, obtain the software and the hardware. You know, you, you have to, put in a lot of work and a lot of trial and a lot of effort to get these actual t attacks working and tested. Well, if you get the BMD standing in front of you, you know, purchased off of eBay, it's pretty easy to, or it's relatively straightforward to try something and see if it works and then try something and see if it works and then try something and see if it works in the comfort of your own home. But when we start digging into a lot of these assumptions at a more technical, specific level, they start becoming issues in a different way. Because, you know, MITRE, this is a moderate assumption, but, you know, configure software to perform file transfer keystrokes and button presses through pixel coordinates. That's talking about building the actual Bash Bunny attack. That's not quite how we did it. That's not what our proof of concept attack does. And there are specific reasons we don't use that approach. But, you know, it starts without the details, without the very, very specific technical information about this. A lot of these assumptions start looking very, very, very different because the report that Professor Haldeman and myself wrote was to the court. We wrote that for a judge, for lawyers, for an audience that's a not super technical audience. If we were writing a report to MITRE, to technical, to you know, academics, we would have included other information that was not available to MITRE. And so these, you know, this reliance on assumptions is effectively what they had. And to be clear, MITRE was very upfront. They put this directly in their, uh, in their report that you know, they did not have access to the equipment. They did not have access to the proof of concept attacks. 
and they you know made a fair number of assumptions well when it comes to the equipment they were hired by the vendor if I'll stay back here sorry you know if it was possible to give them access to the equipment uh, we never even heard from MITRE not not to clarify you know proof of concepts not to clarify understanding of how the attacks that we you know built for demonstration worked but especially not for how does it actually work. Give us the things so we can replicate it. These technical details and the, this you know, inability to understand the very, very specific of it changes the entire analysis of this. Because in addition to this, they have a lot of criteria in addition to difficulty, one of them being scalability. And you know, a lot of time, for I, if I remember correctly, just about every attack they rate scalability as the attack targets and impacts a single voting machine, impacting a statistically insignificant number of votes and will not be impacted and will not impact the outcome of an election. And from one perspective, that is not a false statement. You know, we talked about, if you read the report, there's all of the attacks are focused on how do we get malware onto a BMD, but getting it onto a, B, and D is not the same thing as getting it on to a hundred or a thousand or however many there are. You know, so this scalability needs to be di viewed differently. One of the attacks is you know, take hardware, put it inside the printer, physical attack. The way we, our proof of concept work, we disassemble the printer and put stuff in it. Yes, that does not scale very well. That is very hard to do in a pulling place, rip apart and disassemble a printer. You're right. But when it's rated the same as the infinite voter card attack the, or the photocopy ballot that they joined with it. Yes, those, you know, the infinite voter card attack is an attack against A, B, and D. And it took a fair amount of effort to build it and understand it and test it and everything like that. But once it's done, once the attack is built, the actual software and malware is handled, it changes the scalability drastically because it goes from meeting you know, uh, experienced people who understand and have time to here's a, here's a car, go walk up to the machine, plug it in and print a vote. Take it out, plug it in, print a vote. Take it out and it turns into these very, very simple, straightforward steps to scale that attack. And we're talking about you know, some of the others, the bash bunny feasibility. Yes, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of, you know, you have to have access to the software and to the hardware to test these attacks sometimes. But once you have that bash bunny script, you can email it to anyone with a bash bunny. They load it, they put it on, and they're ready to go. So the scalability of these changes drastically when you start approaching it from the actual technical details. You know, the technician card attack. It talks about you know, this, this ability to forge a tech, technician card that allows administrator access to it. Same thing as the infinite voter card, where you know, once it's built, it's very easy to distribute, it's very easy to, or it's less difficult to distribute, it's less difficult to impact more machines by having more people with more tech cards. When you can buy them online, by clicking add to card and a credit card number, it also changes the scalability of this. And that's because, you know, as we've described in the report, a lot of these are not fundamental problems with one location or one, one state jurisdiction or anything like that. They're fundamental problems with how this entire system operates. And so, you know, a lot of things within this report or within our report, we tried to explain and contextualize for the audience, for the, the judge, the legal experts, lawyers, things of that nature. And the, you know, so just because we said this is how we did it, doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. Just because MITRE says we assume that they that the attack is performed this way, doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. You know, 
security is all about creativity and applying different mindsets and different approaches to problems. So you know, when it comes to the scalability and the actual details and as fundamental assumptions that, that Rich talked about, it becomes a lot more complicated, a lot less uh, specific, and much, much harder to reach those foundational conclusions of the report in a scientific way. And I think we're we're going to do some we're going to do some Q and A. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Happy to. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Turn this mic on. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yes, David. Is mic on now. You can hear me. All right, uh, we're ready to take uh, Q&A for uh, Drew and, and Rich. Uh, anyone have a, a question? Sir, I know you've been eager all along. Here. Does going to an all, is it on? It was on. No, that's you that's on, no, I know. The handheld? I'll speak up. Does going to an all does going to an all paper ballot system address all your concerns about uh, using the Georgia machines? That way. Okay. Say again. Does going to an all paper ballot system address all your concerns about doing uh, the voting machines in Georgia? And the follow-on question is, I, I what changes do you want to see that would actually secure the machines? Because all I hear is negativity of, from you guys, not solutions. And any time I talk to people who are just throw bombs, I just kind of ignore them because they're not helpful. They're not solving a problem. So what are your solutions? Thank you. So let me, let me give a couple responses to that. Can you hear me? OK. Can you hear me? Um, a couple responses to that. Um, one is, this talk is about the four corners of the MITRE report. What I, what I believe about, about a secure way to vote in Georgia is simply not relevant to the discussion. We can talk about it afterwards if you, if you want. I, I hope I could, can convince you of, of my point of view. But it's not necessary for this. What's necessary for this discussion is to understand the kind of organization that MITRE is. MITRE is a federally funded contract research and development center. It has special status. It is allowed to not compete for government funds. It is allowed to be a trusted source to the sponsor agencies. And they bear a special responsibility to respect scientific integrity in their work. And when a company like MITRE produces a report in which the authors know the conclusions of the report are somewhere between outright false and misleading, they've crossed the line in scientific integrity. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, what other biases are they carrying over into their relationship with, with sponsors? I have the utmost respect for MITRE. I've worked with MITRE for 30 years. Um, this, is, this is a one-off one event, but it's worthwhile considering that here is a company that is exploiting its special relationship with agencies of the U.S. government to promote a point of view that they know is incorrect. At the very least, I mean, I've supervised thousands of engineers in my career. At the very least in situations like this, a general manager steps back and says, oh, maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we have to go back and reconsider. They don't kind of throw themselves on the railroad track and say, we, we're an awful organization, we're, we're, we deserve to be disbanded, and we're not asking for that. 
we're asking for what every engineering and scientific research organization in the world subscribes to, which is a minimum standard of scientific integrity, which involves admitting when you're wrong, reconsidering conclusions in light of facts, uh, and being absolutely transparent about your conflicts of interest in when, you promote, when you promote a result. So all of these things are absent in this work with, 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 with MITRE. If this were only a single contract between Dominion and MITRE, God knows how Dominion made a contract with MITRE to begin with, by the way. MITRE is not supposed to be taking work from for-profit companies. Um, but, but if this were only a single piece of work between MITRE and Dominion, it would be one thing. But it's not. It's being used by a Secretary of State in Georgia and now another Secretary of State as a reason for not patching the software. Because, yeah, these are vulnerabilities, but they're unfeasible to mount. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna matter. That's what's important to me about this, about this, this discussion. Um, and the, 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 fact, the fact that you have a company like MITRE that I think is, to be fair, exploiting a special relationship that it has with the U.S. government for reasons that we don't currently understand today is a problem. Are there other questions? Yes, sir. S speak straight into it. Thank you for your work, gentlemen. Uh, so I'm in 2024 where these machines uh, th these were the touchscreen machines, right? Were, uh, were they attached to printing devices to create a voter verifiable paper trail in Georgia? Can you say one more time? Were these uh, touchscreen machines attached to a printer to produce a voter verifiable paper trail in Georgia in 2024? 22. Oh, sorry, 2022. Sorry. In 20, yes, Georgia uses these in a BMD configuration. Right. So they do, there is a printer which is what, what's attached to it, but the, you know, part of the report part is there's a way because the malware can interfere with what is printed to that piece of paper, it becomes a question of, of, of A, whether it's printed correctly, and B, even if it's not printed correctly, whether the voter checked it, which research has shown repeatedly is, does not happen as frequently as, as we'd like. But you know, with MITRE's approach to assumptions, they essentially said, well, it's voter, it's voter verifiable, so we'll assume that all voters verify, which is just not the, the situation. But in fact, they can't, they can't verify the QR code, which is what is actually counted. They can only verify the text, which the scanners do not read. Right, yes. but in the, in the, the case of a post-election audit, the they look at the printed. One at a time. <laughs> Uh, in generally, in the case of a post-election audit, they would look at the human readable aspect. Of, they would look at the human readable printout, not the machine readable printout. You want to talk about the audit and RLA that was done? So, uh, if I'm if I'm understanding your, your 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 question, what about the difference between the QR code and the human readable portion? In a post-election audit, uh, wouldn't they be looking at the human readable? Printed form, not the machine readable printed so, form. So two things, two things to keep in mind. So, so, so this is a question that that you would have expected someone at MITRE would have asked themselves. Do these kinds of audits actually occur? The answer is no. The answer is no. Those those kinds of audits simply do not occur. There is no audit, and there has never been an audit in the state of Georgia that compares QR codes to the, 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 the text on the, on the ballot. And to the extent that RLAs can be promoted as a way of, of, of doing that kind of audit, RLAs are such a rare event in the state of Georgia that you might as well assume they don't exist. Thank you. Go ahead, he's, in, he's just gentlemen. You're next. Hold on, Susan, let, let's let him. Let's let him. Sure, I'll, I'll be pretty quick too. Um, so to my recollection, and it, perhaps you can confirm rapidly, uh, one of the reasons that Georgia stated that they are not going to patch is it's a major version uh, upgrade, and it uh, affects how they program ballots and stuff like that, and they don't have an appropriate amount of the tests before they go into a change freeze, no? So the, Georgia has said a lot of things about why they are not patching. 
or why they intend to wait until after 2024 to patch. Uh, they have made a lot of claims that uh, they've asserted that it would take significant amounts of planning and, and things like that. But this has been a year, it's a year out from now. It, the software has been approved since March, if I remember right. You know, you, you have this to, delay in, in, in You have to remember, at, at every step along the way, the director of elections in the state of Georgia has tried to throw cold water on looking at any of the risk measures that you and I would consider to be important. So the Coffee County breach, for example, the Secretary of State's office denied that that breach occurred until when? About a year ago. Yeah, a year. Yeah, a year after year after it it it, it occurred. Um, so so the mindset in the Secretary of State's office is that our systems are locked down, secure, nailed up. Computers, we're not worried about anything, and you shouldn't worry about it either. Um, and and to the extent that this that this report from MITRE says exactly that, that's what they want to promote. That's what they want to promote. I'm not asking you to judge whether this system is more secure than that or that, that, that method is more secure than, than another method. I'm asking you just look at the four corners of the, of the MITRE report and compare it to what comes out of the Secretary of State's office by way of policy. And those are things that line up. Do we have five more minutes here for questions, folks? I, I just wanted to add a clarifying point on the RLA question, because while Georgia says that it conducts RLAs, as Rich points out, they're very infrequent. There are only one contest every two years. But actually, they also have no legal binding. Um, uh, the results are not legally binding. So if you were to launch an attack like Drew has provided with where you change the QR code and you were to conduct a risk limiting audit from the text and were to find that the actual declared winner was wrong and that the text because let's let's assume everyone actually checked their ballot um, and they saw that, that the text was correct it would not have no bearing on the results of the election. The law says that the Secretary of State writes a report about what the RLA found, and so the legal te the text um, on the ballot has no legal standing in Georgia statute anywhere. It is the QR code that is counted only. Thank you. Uh, uh, comment or not? I'll let the... I'll let the lawyers deal with the law and legal code. <laughs> Are there any more questions, please? You have? Sorry to be hard. Sorry? So we were just looking at the picture of uh, the access in Coffee County, and are, are we saying that that would be normal of a county in Georgia, like that that access would be provided? So it's really a good question. It's, it's really a good question. We, and we, we don't know the answer. To, the, to that, but, but, but every time we peel away a layer of the onion, we see a story like that. So this, this started out to be, to be um, um, who's, the, who's the, the woman lawyer that, that, that has been responsible for this? Sydney Powell. Sydney Powell, yes. This had that turned out to be kind of a pet project of Sydney Powell to, to get, get access to an election management system. Um, uh, and um, the, the, the former director of elections for Coffee County um, was let go and immediately hired by a neighboring county. Um, so, 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 so now we, now we have two counties infected um, with, um, with, the, with, the same, with the same kind of management. Um, and, now, and now I guess the Spalding County is under investigation for exactly the same thing. The Secretary of State in Georgia is really pissed off at Fulton County because because they go they go blue they don't go they don't go red so so he's inclined to say you got to question what goes on in Fulton County too. At the end of the day, it's likely that no one is going to trust what goes on in the election um, buildings in any of these any of these counties. But right right now, it's two, maybe three, maybe four. Forgotten the question. I got. I got wound up in my answer. 
just wondering if this patch is needed with other Dominion machines and has it been offered to other states that use Dominion? So the, you're talking about the 5.17 upgrade? Until literally yesterday, we only had the 5.5A system to evaluate, so we could only assert things about 5.5A. We, request, we offered to test other systems with the vendor. We offered to help with the patching. Um, so we, I can only assert that 5.5A has to be upgraded, uh, but I will say from experience and, and living it, the way computers, computer software is, is built, similar software with similar bugs has similar vulnerabilities. So, so the question for my county is, are you using 5.5A? So the question for my county is, are you using 5.5A? I think the question for your county would be more of, if you assume that whatever version of the software you use, would these attack has these problems? Are there steps being taken? Are there correct, you know, valid RLAs being generated? Are the QR codes being compared to the? Here in Georgia, your county uses 5.5a. Okay. Orange County, California. Okay. So uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, again, I don't have a question, but I have a comment, and that is I just want to stress how critical the fact that the election management system software was stolen from Coffee County. It's more critical in Georgia than it would be other places, again, because the entire state uses the same election management system, the same software, the same everything. So it doesn't matter how many counties have this problem how many counties somebody could wander in and get something. It doesn't matter. What matters is one. And that one, the election management system software was stolen and it was immediately put online for access by whoever wanted it for whatever purpose. And that is a danger for the entire state of Georgia. It's not just one county at risk. Thank you very much. All right, please, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna end here. Would you please thank our panel?